Pues buenas noches a todos. Good evening, good afternoon. On behalf of the Nuclear Physics Group, I'd like to thank BBVA Foundation for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be here. We have two wonderful lectures on two interesting experiments worldwide based in the CERN. And we have the privilege of having the honor of having two keynote speakers, two great researchers who need no introduction. To my left, Professor Maria Jose Garcia Borge. She is a spokesperson in the case of ISOLD facilities from CERN. She has contributed worldwide as a pillar of the scientific community. And she's, since the very beginning, been working professionally with the ISOLD experiment or ESOLD experiment. And we have here her leadership, and now she is the spokesperson, so ESOLD. And now Dr. Enrico Chiaveri, to my right, who's a spokesperson of the uh, NTOF uh, facilities from CERN. He's developed his career in the field of particle accelerators and thanks to his management capacities and as a problem-solving expert, he's occupied important positions at CERN in the case of human resources as a manager and other important tasks. As a member of the NTOF group, having the possibility of working with and for Dr. Chiaveri has been a great privilege because thanks to Dr. Chiaveri, we have had the fantastic facilities he's going to describe. And I'm going to make a very short introduction, but I'd like to say to give a token recognition to those two wonderful experiments. He sold for 50 years, been there as one of the oldest and most uh, more important facilities and the leadership of or the edge of the beam uh, production of radio uh, production of radioactive beams and all nuclear physicists uh, in Spain have worked with ESOLD and TOF is a bit more modern and uh, the and TOF means a big contribution means a very important role for us nuclear physicists it's been created by Spanish experts 20% of the facilities are stemming from Spanish proposals, but this is a very important uh, experiment for the nuclear physicists based in Spain, coordinating important projects, very ambitious projects all over the uh, sector of nuclear physics. And CERN, it's a very positive symbiosis because Spain and CERN working together for 15 years, NTOF has become uh, the leader worldwide regarding uh, this field, competing with other labs like Los Alamos. Without further delay, the floor is to Maria Jose Garcia Borge. And uh, after the two lectures, we'll have a 30-minute Q&A session. And now, without further delay, the floor is to the lady doctor. You have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Danny, for this introduction. I wanted to thank uh, uh, the presence of our attendants. I'm seeing a few familiar faces. I am here to present the ESOLD facility. My talk is entitled Achievements and Challenges, but I will start with a short detour, since actually this facility is mostly devoted to nuclear structure. And hence, I should start by explaining what a nucleus is. It's made up by protons and uh, neutrons, and it occupies uh, most of the matter in the atom. Notice that the atom is mostly vacuum, and the nucleus is occupied by protons and neutrons, usually represented in red and blue. If we had one cubic centimeter of uh, iron nuclei, it would be 300 ton heavy. However, uh, one cubic centimeter of uh, uh, iron is only 7.9 grams. So nuclei are made up by neutrons and protons. Plenty
plenty of those. So if I wanted to represent these in a 2D graph, plotting protons and neutrons, in the middle I see a black dots, the stable points, the ones we tend to see in nature. For uh, lighter elements, the number of protons and neutrons is equal, and for heavier elements, the, the curve rises, and we add an extra 50% neutrons to make the system stable. So out of all those nuclei, we see that the area of the black dots and, uh, well, there are other colors too. In our labs, we have produced about 2,700 nuclei, and theory determines that an equivalent number is uh, or still remains to, uh, uh, to uh, be uh, ligated. We know, we have learned with years, because nuclear physics is 100 years old or even older, we know that there are some, there are some nuclei that are more stable than others, depending on excitation, pretty much as in with noble gases. So they have a number of N, Z or N2820. They have their magic numbers with special stability processes or uh, characteristics. And also, these nuclei that we're representing in colors, uh, well, the ones that are not stable disintegrate. Either they break through fission or uh, they have two, nuclei, uh, two protons and two neutrons. And if they're rich in protons, they have one for each and they issue one positron and one neutrino, or one neutron and a proton, they issue one electron and one anti-neutrino. Those are the basic processes in nuclear physics. And uh, they're highly complex. And uh, for stable elements, we call it the stability valley. Well, most of these uh, nuclei are deformed. Only those with magical numbers are spherical. And as we grow away from the stability valley, the most exotic elements, most difficult to produce in the lab, have a, a different kind of structure. Some of them form a halo around the central core. Others will issue two protons rather than uh, breaking a pair. Others are grouped down in clusters. And one hot topic in the past few years is the way these magic numbers, which are the very pillars of our models, vary as we grow away from the stability from the stability valley. So. One fundamental question in nuclear stability is, what's the latest chemical element? As you know, this year, number 113, 117, and 118 have been named, but the probably is not over yet. So what are the fundamental questions on nuclei? Well, the first question is, how is a nuclear a nucleum formed based on protons and neutrons? Well, nuclei have a quality that no other system has. And it is the fact that they have collective properties and individual properties at the same time. So how to explain those collective properties in which all those protons and neutrons contribute to other behaviors in single particles? And why certain irregularities appear or certain symmetries in this kind of system with so many particles, a clustered together as we see here. Well, for us experimental uh, physicists, there is such thing as measurements. We tend to work with observable measurements like mass, radium, momentum, spin, uh, the, the length of time of a nucleus and how it disintegrates, and also the different possibilities for transition. And we compare those observables to our theoretical models, which somehow reflect that duality between individual properties as the layer model based on magic numbers. And for collective behavior, we use uh, median field uh, models. Lately, there has been a great revolution that allows us to create calculations based on the first principles. In other words, based on the interactions of 
two of those particles, either two protons or two new neutrons. And that helps us uh, describe these sort of systems. Another fundamental aspect of nuclear physics is the genesis of elements. The usual question is, where do all chemical elements come from? And we do know how elements are produced as far as ion-55. We know that protons and neutrons are formed between uh, the first and the second second after the Big Bang. And for, then the fusion of hydrogen and deuterium to form helium is very slow. And thanks to that, we're, st we're still enjoying sunlight because our sun is a middle-aged star and it's still burning hydrogen to produce helium. When hydrogen disappears, the reactions that lead to fusion, for instance, we join three alpha or three helium particles to form uh, carbon-12 to form, uh, in turn, oxygen. These are very fast processes that take place in nature and lead us all the way up to ion-55. That's the most stable uh, nucleus. And then the system stops. What does the system do then? Well, if the density of neutrons in the universe is slow, the probability to capture one of those neutrons and turning into a heavier nucleus is smaller. So it the curve follows this zigzag shape in which the capture of electrons is alternated with the Z factor in, in, a, in a slow process. So we call it the S process. However, there's no way to explain how thorium and uranium are produced using this process. Because then uh, we take a leap into lead, which is also very stable. So there are two possible scenarios for stable nuclei, and we don't really know the role and probability of each process. One of these processes, well, the thing we need to create is a large neutron density to quickly capture uh, neutrons and then follow the black line into the area of stability that brings us from further away to these numbers by passing lead, the heaviest and most stable element. So these processes involve the unification of neutrons. They a mix among themselves, creating a huge density in a slow process, a slow cold process, or the collapse of a supernova where we have a huge density of neutrons. What we uh, nuclear physicists do is measure uh, sections and disintegration processes that allow us to determine the mass of the identified nuclei and use that in astronomical models to create a believable astrophysical scenario that can reproduce the abundance of chemical elements as we find them in nature. In order to study this nuclei individually, one by one, with, under our own microscope, we need to go to the lab. There are two different ways to use or to, to produce this kind of nuclei. And uh, both methods are complementary. One of them is called ISOL, which, which means the isotope online separator, where you use a, a proton beam with high intensity on a thick range, usually a circuit, as we see here, filled with a certain material, which can be uranium or lead, any material, at a very high temperature in such way that the products of uh, uh, the ratio are ionized and distributed. And only one of those, as you can see according to the arrow, may come out and be taken to the experimental study system. The other alternative is based on a very heavy nucleus that goes through a very uh, thin slab, and all the products are shot to, towards the inside, towards a mass separator, where we will try to separate the products. This kind of method 
de las que llega va, va a permitir acceder al núcleo. Will allow us access to faster nuclei with a life uh, uh, mean of microseconds and will give us a panoramic view of ligated nuclei. Whereas the ESOLD system allows us to study each individual system and uh, understanding its properties. So, what we have uh, at the CERN is uh, one of these uh, ISOL facilities. Here we have the Linux E2 producing protons, a proton booster, and then that proton beam is uh, sent to the Isold facility. In Isold, we take 40 to 50 percent of the protons produced in uh, Isold, partly because each of these or many of these injection processes can be injected into the next stage. So for each of these rings, there's always an experiment like the one uh, Professor Javredi was presenting. A few words about the Isold facility. Professor, Professor Panon has said it's the oldest facility of the CERN, working since 1967, approved in 1964, and it has survived thanks to an ongoing transformation, both of experiments and the technical side of the facilities. Right now, thanks to the experience we have in Isolde, we have access to over 1,300 isotopes, the largest number that can be produced in any other facility around the world. World. It provides low and high energy beams to study reactions, and as all experiments in the CERN, it involves a cooperation of right now 18 countries. Uh, I have listed the uh, different flags here from Belgium to the UK, going through Poland, the latest uh, uh, to join. And here we see the skeleton of the facility. We have two white units. So we can uh, use a maximum possible number of experiments up to a maximum of 50 every year. So how does the facility work? How do we produce those nuclei? Well, here we are, back to the proton beam coming from the booster and the uh, two uh, units. So we uh, send the proton beam towards uh, a target and by spalling, or, or by fragmentation, we create asymmetric pieces, or we produce uh, similar similar size uh, spots. So all we can produce all elements in the periodic table under different uh, uh, section, depending on the final production of the mass of the target. So it is important for it to be highly massive and with high energy. And here we see a part of those nuclei. The ion source, in other words, to ionize the elements, is a chemical one. So when applying it, I can pick all all the isotopes of the same chemical elements represented here, beryllium in this case. And then there's a magnetic separation de depending on mass by low uh, charge. And if I join these two elements, only one nucleus can be produced, in this case beryllium-14, with a very short medium life. And uh, in the case of elements that are very similar, we use use laser beams that allow us to ionize a system and then produce a an individual selection of each system. As you can see, there are losses in transmission and in the ionization of systems that are not negligible. And part of the knowledge of this kind of facility involves trying to reduce losses between initial production and uh, uh, whatever is supplied to the user. Does the kind of material matter? Well, of course it matters. Here we have an example of vanadium carbide and calcium oxide to produce the same nucleus. In this case, argon-32. It's a, a quite exotic nucleus. It lasts only a few milliseconds. And the measuring time has been exactly the same. In one case, we only have access to one of the states. And in the other case, we can have a detailed spectroscopy of this kind of study that we can later compare 
with our own theoretical models later. And here we can measure the uh, mean life of this nucleus and its intermediate states. Once we have produced the nucleus, what do we use it for? Well, basically to take measurements of nuclear physics or atomic physics, like the ones I was showing. We run astrophysics studies to create inputs for uh, the genesis of elements. We also uh, run some models for fundamental interactions and uh, for the standard model. And 30% of the time is devoted to applications for uh, materials physics and for biophysics and medicine. And what do we measure? We measure those observables I was talking about to use them in our models to study fundamental states, spin, parity, radios, transition probabilities, etc. Where do we measure this? Well, here's an image of the facility. As you can see, there are plenty of systems in this facility because for each of these properties we use one device. This is the machine, the robot that brings in the targets, the separators, and one dozen low energy lines at the end of which we have different devices. For instance, with ECRIS, we measure atomic properties of the nuclei. With isoltrap, we measure mass. Disintegration is observed in IDS and TAS. And we can also bring in systems developed in our own labs, and then we can do a plug-in and take data and, uh, so that we can bring them home, which is very useful for small uh, teams. To highlight the Spanish participation in Isolde, I have used the Spanish flag in areas with a high Spanish participation, which, as you can see, goes from beta disintegration, nuclear reactions, all the way to material properties, which are uh, fundamentally uh, done in the Basque uh, University. I'm going to use a few examples here to explain the kind of physics we do at Isolde. I've, I've said that one of the most significant properties shown in and the most unstable nuclei is the halo structure. I said that at the beginning. Some particles are uh, uh, so loosely linked that they grow away from the nucleus in an abnormally large radius. This is something that has been seen through uh, different reactions. And we actually ran an experiment proposed by a theoretical uh, team of the Seville University to try and reproduce the Rutherford element on how properties change in the case of a halo nucleus. We can see that the nucleus core, this central area, behaves as any regular nucleus, like those Rutherford used to study more than 100 years ago. However, this, one, this particular one has an infinitely smaller section, which we can understand because the nucleus is not very ligated. And instead of favoring elastic uh, collision, Actually, it, it is easily broken due to its own energy, uh, own low energy. Another hot topic in the past few years is the magic numbers. Certain nuclei have a very special kind of stability. The first excitation states had very high energies, even above a 4 meth, which are easy to understand if you place the latest particles as if they were the optical, optical electrons of atoms in some sort of closed layers. The layer was closed and a huge energy difference was created. And to populate that state, a lot of energy is required. And if there is not enough energy, the system gets no excitation and remains stable. And what we have observed is that as we grow away from the stability valley, the rate of a proton to neutrons grows identical, or is no longer identical. Neutrons, neutrons increase a lot. 
So the ratio varies so much that these magic numbers disappear, orbits blend in in a different way, and new magic numbers appear. So to fine-tune our theoretical models, we have to propose experimental data that will allow us to understand the evolution between this situation and a given situation. And that takes a whole set of experiments. One of those experiments to measure uh, the observable properties of the fundamental state of the nucleus is studying the atomic superfine structure of well, the nucleus is in the center of the atom. Its uh, size, it's very small, but not negligible. And it still has an influence on atomic states due to the nucleus spin. So laser beams today allow us to highly accurately measure these uh, unfolding in levels, and thanks to that, we can deduct nucleus properties, which in turn allows us to determine variations in charge radios within isotopes and electromagnetic properties like spin, momentum, and quadrangular momentum, uh, quadrupolar momentum. This system, which has a certain experimental complexity, has been applied to calcium nuclei. These are very important nuclei because they have two important isotopes that are double magic. They have a, num a magic number of neutrons and a magic number of protons. So by studying these structures and by determining the center of the distribution of peaks, we can determine the radius of this nuclei. What we have observed in the lab is that double magic numbers calcium 40 and 48 have a smaller radius. It's a spherical nucleus with a smaller radius, which we already expected, but the nucleus of calcium uh, 32 was expected to be similar, and yet, experimentally, we see that the nucleus of calcium 52 is actually larger, and this affects the distribution of charge away from stability. Actually, these numbers numbers were uh, recently published in uh, one of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, publications in the field of physics. We also have the possibility to measure mass in the nuclei. We uh, get them into a, an electromagnetic trap. We scan the radio frequency field, and when the frequency matches the internal frequency of this oscillating particle, that energy is picked up. So when when you measure this nucleus, it will have a lot more energy because it captures it from the external field and it will reach the detector faster. So we can measure a nucleus mass, which, as you know, depends not only on the number of protons and neutrons, it depends on the number of electrons, too, if it's the atom, but also depends on the energy of the laser beam. So if we measure the mass, we can determine the energy of the laser beam. And thus, we can know certain nucleus properties. When we plot the mass variation in different systems, we observe that in certain cases there are huge changes in uh, the binding energy that are associated to the presence of magic numbers. In other cases, there is some sort of plateau that indicates a consistent shape. In other words, measuring a parameter like mass allows us to deduct important parameters of the nuclear structure. We have said that nuclear physics has a, or takes plenty of inputs or, or observables to study the genesis of elements. At the bottom of this slide, we see the impact of um, nuclei mass on the different models to generate the element genesis. And we see that there are huge variations of the order of 2,000 kiloelectron volts when uh, we can only uh, capture a few. So if, if we could measure these masses, in the input for the models would be enormous. So we want to figure out the difference between the unification of neutron stars, the process of which is very far away from the stability valley. It's a cold process, and it happens when a supernova explodes. 
Para ello, hemos hecho también unas medidas de And to, for this purpose, we have also conducted mass measurements. And in the region of cadmium, we see the predicted values in blue, actual values in red, and we can see that they do match with the data of solar abundance, meaning that in this area, the most probable scenario is a supernova explosion. So, as I said, a solde is a facility that is by now 50 years old, and it continues by constantly evolving. Lately, we've been doing more experiments on energy increases or to raise the, the energy and the intensity that will give us access to much more exotic nuclei. The heart of this energy increase is this module that allows us to accelerate laser beams in very small distances. It is made up by five different cavities that are superconductive and one solenoid in the middle. I'm using here the flags from the different countries to which uh, the different companies that allowed the construction of this module belong. So here's the full system and with its uh, ultimate assembly details. The first experiments that we have conducted this year with an energy of 5.5 MeV MeV per nucleon. Well, you can you can see the celebration on September 9 this year when two of our operators were there from Spain, one from Salamanca, the other one from Seville. We also had a student from Madrid, and so far the system is up and running. And as we speak, an experiment is being conducted by a team from Madrid and Huelva. It's actually my own team. They're uh, starting collecting data tomorrow. So what do we get from this higher energy now? Well, the blue zone was the old level of energy. And after a certain amount of energy is required, we cannot see a thing because we don't have enough energy. With the new higher level of energy, we can explore other structures that will allow us to deduct the shape of the nucleus beyond theory. And uh, this is something we celebrated on September 28th. So let's take a look at those applications that take up 20 to 30 percent of the time uh, we spent in Isolde going to materials and uh, biomedicine. Well, allow me to make another small introduction. Let us remember that uh, knowledge transfer for nuclear physics to medicine is the fastest yet. And obviously, we can all see the hand of Rengen's wife. I don't know if she wanted to show uh, this x-ray with uh, a bracelet and a ring to prove that we, we scientists can afford it. And actually, this was uh, uh, a cigarette box that was used to uh, disseminate the importance of x-rays, which are intrinsic to science today. So what are radioactive nuclei used for? Well, they can be used for diagnostic purposes, nuclei as tracers, if you want to produce a new drug, but you don't know how the body's metabolism will react to that chemical product, well, you just attach a radioactive nucleus issuing radiation, either beta or gamma, and you can take an image of where the drug ends up. Sometimes you fix one thing and uh, uh, damage things around it. And that's why it is so important not only to know the dynamics of the process, but also taking a clear medical image. And now that we're dealing with cancer treatment where a radioactive ion is injected to uh, run a PET image of a single photon, here we can see where this patient's, uh, patient exhibits a uh, uh, metastasis, or we we can also use positrons that has higher resolution because in annihilating the positron issues to gamma and allows us to know where it was issued. Also, radioactive nuclei are also used in therapy, either via radioisotopes or radioactive nuclei or 
they more and more frequently through proton accelerators or carbon ions. The advantage of these accelerators is shown here. In the past, we had lots of X-ray bombs. And now we use a very high dosage to superficial tissue. Or we needed it back then, but when you use protons at different energy levels, you can cover the whole area of the tumor with the lower doses, this is log scale, for healthy tissue. At any rate, medicine in its struggle against cancer has developed customized or personalized treatments. Scientists have discovered that for the same kind of tumor, the same treatment on two different page patients yields a very different response. And to prevent collateral effects or side effects, scientists are aiming to use the same chemical elements for diagnosis and for therapy. And this is what we now call thera theranostics. And there's a world effort to find uh, those couples, those pairs. So for diagnosis, we need a positron issuer, whereas for therapy, today we need an alpha or a beta issuer to cure cancer. That's the therapy side. So this is a cross-functional effort that requires, first and foremost, the identification of nuclei and identifying pairs of the same chemical elements to see if these pairs can be joined to a known ligand and placed with the antibody which will surround the tumor to attempt to reduce it. In that sense, the Isolde contribution has been the production of not a single pair, but of four different isotopes that issue alpha positrons and electrons. These terbium isotopes have been connected to a ligand called bombesin and have been successfully applied in prostate, breast, and stomach cancer. In these cases, uh, there has been a 100% success rate They've been applied to other types of cancer with a lower success rate. So what we're doing in Isolde is trying to find this kind of radioisotopes. And for this purpose, the CERN has uh, given such relevance to these uh, researches that a whole center has been built so that uh, uh, this new module has been uh, joined to Isolde to produce targets with a, a small train that takes targets to the treatment zone so that these uh, radio drugs can be produced and sent to different hospitals in the Lausanne University in Geneva or perhaps to different European institutes for biology and biochemistry purposes. This research uh, had it, ran its first tests in, or will run its first tests in 2017 and will be up and running in 2018. In sum, the future of his old is brilliant and uh, ever-growing. For nearly 50 years, his old has been working, and it remains a leader both in the design of new devices and in the production of new physics science. I hope my examples have been convincing. For the first time ever, heavy nuclei have been accelerated in Isolde at an energy level of 5.5 MeV per A. I've showed you one of the uh, spectrum. And the specialization field of Isolde keeps growing with uh, uh, medicine applications, with the medicines uh, application that will start working in 2017. That's it. Thank you very much. Hablará mi compañero, profesor Enrico Cavieri. Well, I am leaving the floor to Professor Enrico Chiaveri. After such a wonderful lecture, how would I dare make a presentation as beautiful and as interesting as yours?
as yours. But anyway, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends from the world of sciences. Prior to starting our conference, I'd like to give a token recognition to PVVA Foundation for this wonderful opportunity to present here, to explain here our objectives, our specificities in the field of nuclear physics and how will this fit within the CERN uh, scientific program. My Spanish is not very good, so this is why I apologize, but I'm going to give my lecture in English, but uh, you can ask questions in Spanish, no problem, or in English. Now I can switch in English. Okay. Um, now we are going to switch in English, and then uh, the title of the, my presentation is, uh, is Bright Future for Newton, which is, in fact, the reality since uh, the year 2000. And then, in fact, we have to say the accurate knowledge of a wide vari variety of nuclear data is essential to understand many, many different processes which is we have in nature. And uh, as presented by, already by Professor Bogen, it's a very nice presentation. In fact, what we are going to use is a neutron. In fact, at CERN, uh, most of the main, main, main stream of activities with the protons, and in our case, is neutron. Neutron is a, is a particularity, the, the particle which is neutral, and then, in fact, we can interact directly with the atoms because they are not suffering of the Coulomb barrier. Now, I, I would like to, to go through rapidly, and then I come back, uh, if I have a time, what was the history of, uh, of Entoff. And the history of Entoff starts uh, from this uh, experiment, and the idea was from uh, Professor Carlo Rubia, the Nobel Prize, and then he got uh, the idea to do this experiment in order to understand what could be the, the, the effect of neutron interacting with some element putting in this, uh, uh, in this block of lead in doing a kind of transmutation. This was, in fact, the title is uh, uh, Transmutation uh, um, um, uh, by uh, Resonance Crossing. Okay, this is the title. And then after this, uh, uh, Professor Rubia got the idea to, in fact, to have a specific facility who is going to do the analysis of the neutron-induced process interacting with uh, different material. In particular, at, at the time, for him, it was very important to have all the measurement of the cross-section, which is the probability that uh, the neutron interacted with the atoms, in order to, let's say, to retreat in some way the waste, which is uh, the transuranic element. Then this is a, it was the first phase in the year 2001 when they start. And in fact, the idea at the beginning was focus on the waste transmutation activities. Then, in fact, uh, uh, others, um, member of the collaboration, joint collaboration in, do, in moving in astrophysics activities on, on basic nuclear activities. And uh, we, we got, unfortunately, a difficult period. Difficult period because we got some problem in this, uh, in this uh, target of lead. Uh, but this is an example of something that I would like, I put it, because I would like to underline something that even having three years without measurement, because we have to replace this uh, target, the collaboration remain together. And this is, I can tell you, for the people who are involved in the collaboration activities is a really a success. Okay, then we continue. In 2009, we start with a new target, and then we are going to do a lot of measurement. And, uh, and then, uh, finally, in 2014, we are going to, when we come to this, we are going to build a new, a new area, which is a vertical beam, which is unusual in some way, to have a vertical beam. I can tell you from my experience, to discuss with radiation protection people, it was really a nightmare, because vertical beam means that you have radiation that go outside, you know? And that's, imagine what does it mean uh, uh, for them. Now, I like this, 
because my question is why we, we do all this? For what? And then, in fact, I, I, <laughs> this, uh, uh, this sculpture from Rodin I like because he's a thinker. But I, I know, I discovered the history that in reality, Rodin he wants to, uh, uh, let's say, to present uh, Dante Alighieri. Uh, he was just in front of the hell. And then he realized that Dante Alighieri physically is not very interesting, uh, you know? And then he preferred to, uh, to create uh, this, uh, which is became the sinker, became creator. What we are doing, we are doing, in fact, uh, we have tried to do in our activities to, to give some answer to the really important point. Now I'm going to present you the three different lines uh, of activities. One is the nuclear waste transmutation. In fact, this is the, was the idea that uh, Professor Rubia got at the time. And then, of course, Newton is a fundamental application for this. Uh, and uh, in the recent year, a new study has been triggered by Eugen. There is an urgent need to find, save, clean, and possible economic energy supplies uh, to progressively re re replace fossil fuel to a limited emission of CO2. The design of advanced nuclear energy system require, of course, accurate and newer data. The engineer needs to know what is going to happen if you're interacting the neutron for the different energy for different elements that they are going eventually to use for the nuclear plant. One example possible, which is unfortunately, uh, we are still waiting um, a prototype, is to use which is called accelerator-driven system. This is the new approach, which is in fact a combination of the nuclear panel accelerator. Now for the people who are involved in the nuclear activities, nuclear plant activities, they can understand immediately that for the nuclear plant to have an accelerator, which is in fact uh, uh, is something from outside world of this environment is a lot of problem to, to just to, to, to accept and to understand. We have to do a prototype, what we didn't succeed until now. Now, I simply uh, sum up. I hope that this uh, data is still valid, but this is a simply, uh, maybe I don't want to, to go in all the details, but just to give you the order of magnitude of uh, what, what does it mean to retreat uh, all this waste? Well, we can, of course, we can imagine to have this final disposal, okay? You have uh, an order of magnitude of the amount of money that we have to pay to do this. In the case, I took uh, the example from uh, US. And, uh, and then, of course, this is, is going to increase more and more. It's something that we have to consider, we have to, to, re, to treat. Uh, maybe what I'm going to say is, is something that politically is not so easy to manage, but okay. Now, this is not, I don't want to, 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 to spend more time, but simply to tell you that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the most important measurement that we have to do uh, with the neutron is capture of fission, I come to this point, is a different, a many different element which is called transuranic. The engineer has to know, construct the new generation, if possible, the nuclear plant, they have to know how they have to uh, interact with this element because the idea is to have a nuclear plant who's going to retreat in some way the waste transmutation. And they ask us uh, to have data which is uh, in, the, in the uncertainty of three or seven percent, which is a very, very difficult to have it. Now, new generation of uh, reactor. Of course, there is, um, there is uh, I would say, summing up uh, Two possibilities, as I mentioned before, accelerator driven system, which is, a, in fact, a system which is a subcritic. In other words, if something happens, you stop the accelerator and then you stop the process. Well, um, it's easy to say, it's not easy to, to realize, but that's why we need a prototype. Or as uh, the Indian, uh, they want to develop another approach using thorium, and then thorium, of course, as the priv thorium uranium privilege not to produce uh, this uh, very toxic and uh, radioactive uh, waste uh, element. 
Now, we are going to do in Entoff andro astrophysics underground, which is a contradiction somewhere, you know? But in fact, it is this. In fact, uh, what we are going to do, very well, by, by the way, presented by Professor Borge, in fact, and if we used to say that the first three minutes, uh, the, uh, the helium, the hydrogen, the hydrogen, and the lithium has been produced. Okay, but then starting, as mentioned by Professor Borger, from iron and so on, of course, this is a, it could be produced by, let's say, neutron-induced process. Now, what we can do, with this is, a, uh, in fact, is a summing up the possible process already presented by, by Maria. In fact, uh, what we are going to do in Entoff, but we are going to measure to the neutron which is interacting with some samples. I come to the point when I use the word samples, and then we are going to measure the cross-section, which is, in fact, the probability then the neutron interacting with the atom of the samples, you know? And then, in this respect, we can, in doing astrophysics underground, we try to, to understand what, what could uh, and help the astrophysics. I come to the point, what does it mean, help the astrophysics? Um, the medical application, I would say, is a, maybe a, is a big word for us, isn't it? Tough, is, um, but uh, simply to tell you that uh, in um, some two years ago, there was a proposal to do some measurements, some experiment, and they were more were focusing this uh, uh, neutron capture therapy process. Okay? Until today, this process has. Uh, <clears throat> Has been, has been treated with the boron, okay? Which is a binary therapy because it consists in the ejection of boron in the human body in some way that it will be selected and absorbed by the tumor cell. Now, there is uh, somebody who joined the collaboration from Granada, the University of Granada, who proposed to do some measurement with the sulfur, which did it, which is in fact is also an element important for the astrophysics. And the idea, according to some uh, expert, uh, uh, they consider the possibility to replace eventually boron. Boron is toxic, boron also there is gamma emission, which is probably not the case of sulfur, but the sulfur has a cross section, which is uh, probably 1,000 higher than boron. Then we cannot keep the patient for one week uh, there in waiting that a neutron is going to, to interact. Okay. Now, uh, I, I took this photo because uh, this is es un proyecto de investigación de la Universidad de Granada, cuyo objetivo es aportar una alternativa, as I mentioned before, en la lucha contra el cáncer. Ha sido financiado por la Fundación Asoci Asociación Española contra el Cáncer, presidida por la reina, don, Dona Leticia. Ok, this I think we have to mention because this is something. Ok. Now, we come back to, to, to Entoff. Entoff, as I mentioned before, in the history, it was focused on the nuclear waste. It was uh, some medical application today. Uh, it was also for astrophysics. And in fact, what we are going to do is to measure cross-section. In other words, is to measure, uh, which is the probability that uh, uh, the neutron interact with the atom of the sample that we want to measure. The collaboration today is, uh, 40 institutions, by the way, coming from the different countries, 150 scientists. I think there is a very little collaboration, I would say. Uh, it's completely different dimension compared to the other collaboration, uh, uh, because, you know, we are not 3,000 physicists and so on. But I mean, this is, is, uh, is, um, is a collaboration who is incredible, very active uh, in doing uh, measurement and research. I think. Uh, Probably most of you have already seen this picture. I wanted to show the picture simply because <clears throat> I wanted to localize where is Entoff. Entoff is there, you know, and this is, of course, is, a, is the LHC, this is the SPS and the PS and so on, and then Entoff is there, and my, my friend is all this there, okay? Now, what we are going to do, why we, we, why we talk about neutron uh, time of flight. Because the time of flight is a method based on direct relation which exists uh, between the energy of the neutron and the time, time of flight, uh, that you need to travel a given 
distance. This is just, I, I choose this example just to show you what we have to do in doing this measurement. Now, uh, this slide, uh, uh, try to follow me. I think it probably is not so easy, but just to, I wanted to sum up in one slide what we are going to do exactly when we have uh, this uh, neutron that is going through in, uh, in the same time for the two different areas. And in fact, we have a vertical one and the horizontal one. This is the horizontal, this is a vertical area, this is horizontal area. And then uh, this, uh, if you're going to complete this, now you can see, in the same time, we are going to have a neutron is going vertically in the area or horizontally. Now, the location of uh, <clears throat> and of facility, you can see a picture. Now, and then uh, this is the, the precise area where it's located, I would say, and tough. And then the next picture is also <clears throat> uh, is just to, to tell you what is a locator, let's say, and tough compared to the environment of airport, uh, Geneva, Prevesin, uh, and so on. Now, as already presented by Professor Borg, and this is a picture who is going to tell you what happened. We have, okay, we have a proton, a 20 GV. We have a 7, 10 to the 12, just to give an order of magnitude of proton. The each 1.2 second is going to, in a pulse mode, to impinging uh, a block of lead, which is 1.3 tons of lead, producing, of course, not only neutron, eh, producing a lot of particle, charged particle, neutron. And then we are going, of course, to select uh, with a magnet, all the charged particle will be cleaned up, and the neutron will be guided by collimator until the area of measurement. When we talk about, I, I'm simply, I go very rapidly, just to have an idea. You are go what we are going to do, but of course, we need a detector that they are going to analyze what happened when there is an interaction, which could be, which is called in our jargon, N gamma or N charged particle or N alpha. And then, of course, we need a different kind of detector to analyze what happened in this interaction. Uh, this is an example in, uh, in experimental area one where you can see a detector. is a detector that has been uh, um, assembled, constructed already in 2001. And I would say uh, uh, thanks to the incredible contribution done by Spanish uh, uh, institution. Now, this is, a, I kid, the people believe that uh, the end of people, they, they took the sample, you know, and then they are going to measure. No, no, it's not this. Huh? No, no. <laughs> we have to be clarified, otherwise there is a confusion. The sample, in this case, I select americium. Americium is one of the transuranic elements produced in, uh, in the process on the nuclear plant. This is an example that I, I select just to give you an idea what does it mean, because this is a, if I remember, 32 milligram of americium. Uh, which is uh, in, uh, encapsulated in 0.5 millimeter of, uh, of aluminum. This is what we are going. There is no interaction with the radioactive element because the, we are going simply to treat uh, this kind of encapsulated element. Now, this is, uh, I would say, let me, let me give me a little propaganda because this is normal, no? Just to show you what does it mean to construct a vertical beam. This is an example of uh, nine meter on vacuum tube that we have to introduce in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the building, go down, down, down until where there is a, a target. <coughs> And uh, this is an example. Now, this is simply to say this was the drawing. This was a dream. Now, the dream became reality. We took if we were in time and budget. You know, you have to know that at CERN, huh, when we are going to do the project, one of the key sentences, are you in time, are you in budget? And we did it in time and budget. And this is, you can see also the, uh, an area where the, the people, they are preparing experiment uh, and the measurement. Uh, 
Then this is an example to say that we work in parallel, in, which is called area one, which is called area one, which is called area two. Now this is, I don't want to go in all the details, but just to give an, a picture of what we have done since 2000, 2002 until today, mixing what was waste transmutation, measurement, astrophysics, nuclear physics, and partially for medical application. Now I come to do something which is we are, incre we are incredibly proud for two reasons. The one reason moving in the logic of the astrophysics underground, then we, we could do something that it was my dream since the beginning to have a close collaboration with Isolde. Of course, for me, Isolde is Isolde, and Toff is and Toff. And then for me, it was important to have a collaboration. And then it was the opportunity to do it with, a, with a Isolde to do a measurement which apparently, according to the, our colleague astrophysicist, I would say is, a, is a more than 60 years that they try to understand this uh, uh, discrepancy between what could be the model and what could be the, some measurement concerning lithium, and that's why it's called cosmological lithium problem. Now, the question is how we can do this measurement, and then uh, the beryllium-7, unfortunately, which is incredibly radioactive, uh, he, uh, he has only 50, uh, 53.2 days of lifetime. 53 days is incredibly short because, you know, you have to have the element encapsulated. Don't, don't worry. Then we go in the area. We are going to do the measurement. We install everything. And then we have to count enough. We have to have enough data. And we have only 53 days. Otherwise, it's going to change another element. Yeah, our measurement could not be done. Nobody in, in this uh, uh, family of neutron gymnastic, Los Alamos, uh, IRMM, or other, they, they could do this measurement. We did it. We did it because we have Isolde. They could really help us in this uh, exercise, which is called measurement for N alpha or N proton. And then we have the opportunity to have experimental area number two, which where the flux is incredible high, uh, very, very high level of flux. And then we can measure, we can do this measurement. Now, what is the result that we are still working? We have a already publication. Uh, we are going, we, we prefer to take our time because uh, well, you imagine after 60 years, we are going to tell to our outstanding colleague that maybe uh, their model is not the ideal one. And that's, we have to, to be very careful. And then we continue, but we have very, very important results. This is, a, once again, an example that, uh, you know, there is a, a physicist who is going to, uh, to install uh, the sample which is a sample, is a 50 giga becquerel to contact. It's incredible high level. It's a, only some microgram, microgram. And this, we did a lot of tests before to do the final action, installing <coughs> the sample in the area. <coughs> Sorry. Now, I would like to, I, to complete my presentation because I, I have to, um, to thanks my colleague, uh, Spanish colleague. Since uh, the beginning, 2000 or 2001, whatever, uh, all these uh, institutions, they gave an incredible contribution, not only in money, in fact, there is a 20% of, uh, of contribution, but also in kind, in scientific production. I think uh, the, the Spanish, they played a very important role. Uh, the, the spokesperson uh, before me is, uh, is a Spanish. We had also two Spanish run coordinator. I mean, they are strongly involved uh, also in the European nuclear project, which is equivalent to 12 million euro. And then he, he now, he, they, if you translate this in business uh, man, uh, the, is a very good ratio compared to what we put in some way. This is a very good impact. And we have a contribution also to the Spanish industry in part of the construction of uh, Area 2. And then, as you can see, uh, the, the Spanish uh, was strongly involved in many different uh, Euratom programs. I think uh, um, we have to say that uh, uh, 
uh, we are very visible today. This is a matter of fact, uh, because uh, we can do measurement that other equivalent facility cannot do thanks to this instantaneous flux, thanks to this two experimental area, and thanks to the high level of competence, in particular for the Spanish colleague. <clears throat> and I think one important point, I don't know what would be, I, I, finally, I don't know the nuclear plant program in, in Spain, but I would say our contribution in the future uh, possible construction of a new generation of reactor, it plays an important role. Now I come to the conclusion, and in fact, we'll, uh, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, we need uh, this accurate new data for the neutral section. It's fundamental for different uh, areas. Uh, I think, uh, and tough, as I mentioned before, I give a strong contribution with a worth effort in, this, uh, uh, in these activities. Oh, as I mentioned, because we have a special characteristic that the other facility, they don't have it. Uh, this uh, wonderful symbiose, symbiosis sorry, between Entof, CERN, and Spanish it was, uh, in fact, a great, great success. And then I have to thank uh, my Spanish colleague. Um, I think we have to say the new area um, offered a unique opportunity to perform challenging measurement, as I, I showed before. Uh, this is just uh, summing up different contract that we have, as I mentioned, in the in this present line and some contribution in conference. Now, I, what I can, I would like to, of course, I have to com conclude that, that there is a bright future for neutron physics at CERN, as I can tell you. And then also, muchas gracias por su atención.